Good afternoon, everyone. Really pleased to be moderating our panel session, uh, well, the last panel session for this evening. And that is looking at the floating market in the Asia Pacific, potential challenges, and future forecast. Um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to each of our panelists to introduce themselves and then we're going to dive straight into questions. I do have the iPad here, so please, if you've got any questions, um, we, would like, we would encourage audience participation, so please have these coming through. Okay, let's start with you, Rujin, and then we'll work through the panel. Hello. Um, my name is Eugene um, Choi, uh, heading up uh, offshore wind business at Korea Generation. In South Korea, we are developing two gigawatt of floating with our partners and the one gigawatt of fixed bottom projects in South Korea. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hope it works. Yeah. It, it works. works. Oh, it works? Okay. Um, I'm Palayu from Ocean Winds, represent the Ocean Winds, and I'm very happy to be here. Ocean Winds is a, a joint venture between NG and EDPR, and we focus solely on offshore wind. Um, we are very keen on floating too, and I'm very looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Aaron? Hey, everyone. Um, nice to be here in Melbourne. Thanks for the warm welcome. My name is Aaron Smith. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Principal Power. We are one of the leading technology providers for the floating offshore wind space, and we got 75 megawatts of capacity operating in Europe. We're really looking forward to bringing our experience to the APAC region. I just realized that I actually didn't introduce myself. So um, I'm Amisha Patel, Director of Public Affairs for Offshore Global at the Global Wind Energy Council and also the internal lead for the Global Offshore Wind Alliance. Thanks, Amisha. <laughs> Uh, I'm Jonathan Spink. I'm the CEO of the Hayuri Offshore Wind Farm in Korea. Um, I'm also the COP uh, Vice President, also based there. Um, so I'm actually Australian, in case you can't tell by my accent, but um, and from Melbourne, so this is a good excuse for me to come home. Um, I've now been in Korea for, for nine months, um, working on CIP and, and COP projects. Uh, we've got a development pipeline of around six gigawatts in Korea, so we're beating BADA. Um, <laughs> A little bit of a healthy competition, um, at, but we've got a 1.5 gigawatt floating offshore wind farm in Ulsan that, that I'm leading development of. Hey everyone, I'm Nick Sankey. I'm the country manager for Blue Float Energy in Australia. I'm based in Melbourne. Uh, Blue Float uh, has a portfolio of four development projects in Australia, uh, two floating and two fixed, with a total capacity of around about six and a half gigawatts. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, but first of all, I think it would be really great for our audience to hear about the current progress of floating offshore wind technology in the region and what each of you see as key policy enablers and key challenges to advancing the sector in the region. So let's start with you, Nick. Okay, well, the progress is pretty easy to answer in Australia because there has been no progress. Um, I shouldn't say that. Um, I guess, you know... Offshore wind in Australia, I'm sure everyone knows, is, uh, is really still in its infancy. Um, so we're having um, sequential declaration of zones in Australia. And so at the moment, in terms of floating wind, um, uh, so I guess just for everyone's knowledge within Australia, um, because of the, uh, there's a large land mass and the existence of states, um, it means the marine uh, environment does differ quite a lot between states. Um, and so we'll really, the floating projects will be centralised off New South Wales, where the water depth is a lot deeper, off Victoria, particularly in Gippsland, where the water is a lot shallower, uh, there'll be mostly fixed projects developed there. So I guess the progress that we're seeing at the moment in terms of floating is the, um, the declaration of the Hunter Zone, which is off New South Wales. Uh, there's currently a process for feasibility licence applications uh, in that zone that close in November. So we're still at the very uh, early stages of floating in Australia, because uh, that's really driven by the, the zone declarations. 
So I guess the, the, the key challenges for floating is to try and, I guess, keep pace with, uh, with fixed within Australia. I think there's absolutely the opportunity for that to happen because um, we're in the unique position of no, no fixed or floating projects within Australia. So there's no reason why we can't see uh, infrastructure development and policy settings um, running parallel for floating and fixed. Um, and so I guess positive uh, and very optimistic that within New South Wales we'll see some uh, floating projects emerging fairly um, soon and quite, you know, not dissimilar timelines to fixed in Victoria. Thank you very much, Nick. Jonathan? Uh, so as I mentioned before, I'm developing 1.5 gigawatts of floating offshore wind in Ulsan, which is on the east coast of um, South Korea. And we are in a cluster with six gigawatts of total generation by other developers, including BADA. There's also Shell, um, Equinor, and Ocean Winds also developing within that cluster a total of six gigawatts. So I do feel like where Australia is still emerging in the floating space, Korea really has a, a wonderful chance to, to develop at scale very quickly. Um, Korea as a market is a, is a great space to be developing offshore wind. They've got pretty good targets, so I think we're chasing around 14.5 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. So there's a, there's a political will um, to, get, to get that sort of outcome in this market. Um, also, Korea has, a, has an extraordinary shipbuilding capability. So in terms of supply chain and ability to deploy this type of technology, particularly floating, which is basically just a gigantic big welded structure, uh, it's, a, it's a really good environment to be able to, to build that out um, really quickly. Um, also, there's, a, there's an auction regime in place with subsidies that are at a great level to support floating in the near term. Um, and in terms of policy and regulation, there's a few challenges along the way, as with most governments, they're trying to learn how to build offshore wind in a market where there is no offshore wind. So that poses a few challenges. Um, but it, it really is in a good space to, to get moving as, as an industry in Korea. Thank you, Jonathan. Wee Jim? Hi. Uh, Hi. So uh, on numbers, adding to what uh, Jonathan Pings, uh, the, uh, the on the the Korea in, in South Korea, the uh, six gigawatt uh, floating offshore wind projects off the coast of Ulsan of South Korea uh, is progressing, and uh, all of projects have obtained electricity business license, and the developers are uh, proceeding significantly. The EIA, uh, you know, the how much uh, offshore, uh, how many offshore wind projects uh, South Korea have uh, as, a, as a track record. Uh, it's only 142 megawatt projects on the operation, but uh, South Korea is uh, ambitiously uh, accelerating to become the floating uh, offshore wind country. Uh, this is because uh, Korea is surrounded by three waters and uh, uh, heavy electricity consumers and uh, many of industrial complex are located on the coastline uh, alongside the coastline uh, of uh, south water and the east water, but the water depth is from the 100 meters to 1,000 meters. So for South Korea, uh, floating offshore wind is not a choice, but uh, uh, mandatory uh, for its uh, decarbonization journey. So uh, th this is not, I believe this is not only the case of South Korea, but also the case of Japan and the Philippines and the other Asian countries. Uh, and although uh, not many Asian countries have had uh, a strong track records on the fixed bottom projects, I don't think, I mean, I don't think the uh, accumulate, uh, accumulation of the fixed bottom offshore wind projects um, is necessarily uh, the prerequisite for the journey to the floating offshore wind journey. Uh, the, um, so the, uh, with different dynamics uh, applied when uh, talking to the shipyards and the offshore plants industries, and uh, there are more similarities with the with oil and gas companies. So the uh, so the so I think the uh, it is right timing for the uh, Asian countries to right uh, jump to the floating offshore wind uh, without waiting uh, further. 
uh, for, without uh, waiting for them to experience more on the uh, fixed bottom projects. And uh, we think the floating offshore wind projects for Asian countries with a great potential for manufacturing and shipbuilding industries uh, will be the game changer uh, for them not to be uh, the follower anymore, uh, but uh, uh, to be the market leader. Thank you, Eugene. Pelayo? Um, I remember uh, when I started talking about floating offshore wind uh, in Japan four years ago, and there were already pilots uh, there, uh, but everyone talked about floating offshore wind as something that has to be studied in university, something which is R&D almost. And I think we came a long way from there. Uh, today we stand in an area of the world, in the APAC region, that is probably the same level as the rest of the, the planet, thinking that floating is real, that is nothing that is completely far into the future. Um, particularly in Korea, we're seeing projects that are being built, uh, sorry, are being planned uh, at a larger scale. Uh, we are there in Korea, so Ocean Winds. We are also looking into Japan and also looking in Australia. And uh, we are very happy with that. There's a lot of things that have to be done, but I think we are not very different in the APAC region compared with the rest of the world. I think people believe in technology. People believe that the floaters float, which is important. The, the issue is how we can scale up that and how can make that happen, the, the big scale projects. And I think that's the point in where we are in most of the uh, countries, at least on the continents where uh, Ocean Winds operates. Thank you. Aaron. All right, so I offer, I guess, a bit of a pan-Asian perspective because I'm not focused in any one market, but basically every market in Asia is a floating offshore wind technology supplier. We see that the fundamentals in this market for floating wind are incredible. There's a huge long-term energy demand when you couple the need to decarbonize electricity and electrify everything and the need to go to more green molecules. There's really no place that needs renewables more than Asia, and floating offshore wind offers a solution for a lot of countries that don't have other domestic options, so it works for energy and economic security as well. That being said, we really see a lag in the policy leadership that is required to put floating offshore wind projects um, together in a really executable fashion. We've proven in Europe that the technology works, that it not only floats, but it also performs throughout the life cycle. And we have that experience ready to bring into new markets. But that's gonna be still quite challenging because in addition to engaging new stakeholders that don't yet have experience with the technology, new government authorities that don't exactly know how the technology fits into their existing regulatory frameworks, and bringing new supply chains into learning curves that need to industrialize the technology from the start. It's a lot of kind of questions and, um, I guess, development that needs to happen simultaneously in order to get the right conditions for these projects to move. And I think fundamentally what we need government to provide is certain predictable pathways to get projects moving in the near term. And we need the leadership to identify barriers and resolve them. And I think a good example is, is port development where floating offshore wind, well, we'll talk about that later. Maybe I won't go there. I was gonna say, <laughs> go you're preempting the next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm That's just gonna, a, I'm gonna cut Aaron off do. here. Cut me off, <laughs> too much. Well, I think, I think I just want to go back to, b before we go on to talking about bottlenecks and industrialization, I just want to pick up on a couple of the points that, that you've all touched on. And Nick, just going back to what you've said about Australia and really sort of kick-starting as a fixed market, um, can, you, can you share some perspectives on um, how industry can work with governments to understand the different needs of floating versus fixed? And then can I ask you all to touch a bit on acceleration? Because I mean, that's a common theme at the moment. We know that time is of the essence to meet targets, to deploy and meet, um, to deploy um, the level, to the levels that we need. So how can we start that acceleration now? And Nick, I'm gonna start with you. Thanks, Amisha. So I think 
The key advantage that Australia has is with the, the deeper waters off New South Wales is that the New South Wales government can be so focused on the floating market. So it's not like the, the New South Wales government is looking at supporting either or, or, or looking at supporting both fixed and floating and having to have different regimes. So when we say we're looking at port development in New South Wales, we've got uh, two zones that have been, uh, well, one being declared, one being outlined, um, the Hunter in Illawarra. There's two natural ports, the Port of Newcastle and Port Kembla. And you can be sure that developers are talking to those ports about developing the infrastructure requirements and the ports are talking to governments about assistance for developing those ports specifically for floating projects. And that's primarily because everyone will be developing floating projects there. There's just not the, the, uh, the, the shallower waters that can accommodate uh, fixed, uh, fixed bottom projects. So it's obviously different down in Victoria where I think you'll see the development of floating uh, probably taking a secondary role to fix. So I think most of the floating projects uh, initially will be focused in the New South Wales market. I think that if the government wants to support, the New South Wales government wants to support offshore wind, they will be focused on, new, on floating projects because that is what makes sense off, um, off, off the New South Wales coast. So we're talking to the government about you know, you know, what kind of regimes will they put in place. Victoria's come out with policy directions papers, with implementation statements, the New South Wales government hasn't for offshore wind. So we know the government is looking at it uh, for New South Wales and those policies will have to be directed towards floating projects because they will know that fixed pro uh, bottom projects are not going to be developed off New South Wales. So that's the big advantage I think we have with Australia and for stimulating the floating projects are the centralisation of the projects off the New South Wales coast. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rujan, let me, let me come to you next. Uh, so the, uh, the, for example, in South Korea, the, one of the justification uh, for promoting uh, the floating offshore wind uh, was to utilizing existing shipbuilding offshore plant industries. Uh, but uh, the, the market have realized that, that uh, the fact that uh, South Korea has the large, uh, world's largest and the strongest uh, shipbuilding industry means uh, the most expensive uh, shipyard and uh, offshore plant. So, uh, that is, the, the, and also the, uh, the shipbuilding industry is booming up, so uh, the, the government and the local municipalities uh, have realized the necessary uh, refurbish or upgrade the tier two and tier three yards in the local town. Uh, so, but, uh, so uh, that re uh, floating, uh, I mean, the putting aside the technologies, uh, I mean, all of the technologies, uh, the uh, relevant technologies are already proven. Uh, and uh, there were uh, sufficient uh, pilot projects. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, the challenge is uh, we need to fight against the, uh, the higher cost. Uh, so the, uh, but to open up the floating offshore market and the for the country uh, wanting to, uh, to be the market leader, uh, they need to show uh, it's the very typical comment, but I'll show the, uh, firstly, the uh, clear and continuous uh, regulatory support, regardless of the government changes. Uh, the Korea is one of the countries which uh, uh, the government changes every four years and five years extremely, but uh, uh, one, um, one, uh, so, uh, one good thing is that the, the floating offshore wind now seems to be um, supported by both political parties. Uh, but the second one is that the uh, government needs to show uh, and uh, allow the more generous and the reasonable tariff if they want uh, the preemptive investment in the supply chain. So uh, without, without that, uh, the generous tariff uh, regime, uh, the floating offshore wind journey is not going to be uh, sustainable. Sustain, sus, sustainable. So, uh, so the Korea introduced uh, the tariff calculation uh, system, which is uh, tariff is differentiated based on the water depth and the distance to the shore, uh, which is to give a higher PPA uh, than uh, the fixed bottom projects, but, are, uh, but still there, there are many things to reform to open up uh, at the market. Thank you. Um, Palayo, I'll go, I'll go to you next, and then Aaron, and then Jonathan. 
Thank you. Um, my previous answer, I was quite optimistic in a way, like saying that people believe on so much on, on, on scale and, and floating ocean wind. Now I'm going to put my hand on the pessimistic. Um, I, I realize I'm talking and hearing what basically Aaron was mentioning, right? The targets and the few countries that have floating targets. In Europe, there are much more countries than in Asia. And we need targets, we need a roadmap on how we implement and how we make floating real. And that touches not only on the targets, but also on the regulation. Um, I live in Tokyo for more than a decade. And one thing that is good in Tokyo is um, that has, the, I think it's the highest number of Michelin stars restaurants in the world. So you can find a good place to eat almost every day of the year. Um, it's double than Paris. And the reason for that, of course, there are several reasons, but one of them is that Japan is one of the easiest places in the world to, to create or to establish a restaurant. Um, if you create a regulation that makes things easier, if you don't put a lot of difficulties to the developers and to the technology, um, I don't think it will be perfect, but it will be much easier. And we are encountering that in all the, basically all the APAC countries, either issues with the cabotage, issues with regulation in terms of, um, was mentioned in that Korea is selling something on the remuneration in terms of depth, but things have to be clarified. I'm based in Japan particularly, and the thing is that basically there's no regulation for floating. And so there is no regulation, there is no way forward, although there is a will and intent for many of the developers, as included, and we see a lot of potential. Um, Australia, I'm not so familiar with the country, but as far as I've been hearing, neither the targets are not a clarity on, on how the floating will remunerate it and with the difference with the bottom fix. I think that will help a lot of the industry move forward and achieve what we all want to achieve, which is a more clean and renewable um, um, planet. I really like, personally, I really like your balance of optimism and pessimism. I mean, I think it's perfect. Um, go on, Aaron. Yeah, um, no, I, I think to sum up what people are saying, it's the technology is ready to go, and these colleagues here and developers in the audience have basically billions of dollars that they want to deploy into these industries and supply chains. So. How do we accelerate? We create an investment environment that is easy. We get projects at sites into the hands of developers so that they can start maturing the business case. When they start to mature the business case, they can engage the supply chain and think about the options to build things locally, to import things that need to be imported, and then we have to have a schedule of offtake auctions that are giving remuneration that is sustainable that is not driving a race to the bottom, because if you have a race to the bottom, then those costs just get passed to the supply chain who can't sustain them, and then you, know, you don't have a successful industry. So I think a lot of the stalled progress that we have in the APAC region is on policymakers to correct, and if they are able to push the uh, a more certain, a more stable, a more streamlined, a less restrictive environment, if they're able to think pragmatically about jobs and local content, then they'll expand the pie and end up getting more, and actually by creating a good and stable market environment, they'll attract people to their state. So be the example from, for the policymakers, be the example, set the right policy, the jobs will come, trust the process. Thank you, Aaron and Jonathan. To add? <laughs> I don't think there's much left. Um, yeah, it's certainty. If you have investment certainty, you have offtake, you have policy certainty, and you have supply, say, supply chain certainty, um, things will move. And probably just to add, the development cost of floating offshore wind is enormous. So the, it is a very capital intensive project to, to build. But to develop it, you also need certainty that what you commit in an auction you can actually build at the cost and to the timeline that you've committed to. Um, so to put that much development cost at risk, you really need certainty that you're gonna get your return. Um, so the sooner we get that policy certainty, the sooner we get that offtake certainty, and that the subsidies are gonna be high and that they're there when we need them, the, the better we can accelerate these opportunities. Thank you, thank you very much. Some very, very strong messages for policymakers there. So let's shift the dial now and f go move, the, move the focus to industrialization. How do we scale floating technology? 
um, how do we deliver these projects um, from a more technical and delivery perspective? Peleo, let's come to you first. Um, I would think I will pass the ball to Aaron, I think, on the technology side. I think he will, he will better talk about that. Sure, yeah, I think it makes sense to start, start on technology and then we can go to how developers are thinking about industrializing for their projects. So from a technology perspective, we've really proven that you can put floating offshore wind turbines in the harshest environments, that you can install them, that you can operate them, that they'll generate power reliably, that we know what to do if there's maintenance events that need to happen, and that gives a really good sense of the requirements for industrialization. I think we draw a lot of talent from the oil and gas space, also from the onshore renewable space. It's one of the reasons why it seems Mel the Victoria, state of Victoria is very well positioned from a skills perspective, but offshore wind is, is going to be different, right? You are creating a system that needs to perform optimally. It needs to do well in every stage of the life cycle, including when it's in construction at port, when it's being towed out to site, when it's being connected, and it needs to generate power for 30 years. That means that the operations that you perform are going to be repeated 100 times. You're going to need to basically deliver something like 200,000 tons of steel just in the floating platform, thousands of kilometers of mooring lines, etc. So the challenges are really high, and you need to make sure that you have your process really well predicted. That means spending time, the appropriate amount of time in design. It means understanding what your infrastructure is from, I'm not gonna go to ports yet, <laughs> although I keep being tempted to go to ports. <laughs> but it, it means basically um, that, that you have to have that, that sort of track record in order to have an execution plan that is going to be robust for a commercial scale project. It also means that we're going to encounter some technology challenges and we're going to have to do things a bit differently than we've done in the pre-commercial projects. So that means much more a move to automated fabrication in a factory setting. It means that we really need to prioritize modularity, standardization. It means that the industry will need to consolidate to different types of configurations that give supply chain certainty that the investments that they're making in facilities are going to be relevant for the long term, right? If you have 100 different designs, people don't know what sort of factory they need to build. So I think the, the industry is making a lot of progress towards industrialization, but it's something that can only happen on large scale projects, and it can happen, like all the technology needs to be developed can happen in those timelines of large scale projects. So we're ready to go to scale, but um, it's gonna be uh, dynamic, trying to, to make it happen on these projects. Right, thank you, Aaron. Um, Peleo, do you want to come in for development yes. perspective? Yes, uh, building all of what's mentioned before, uh, offshore wind and floating offshore wind is very capital intensive. So as of today, what we have been doing has been what we call pre-commercial scale projects. Uh, in the case of ocean winds in, in Portugal, um, in Viana do Castelo with a 25 uh, megawatt project. And all, right now, it's, we're building a project in the south of France. 30 megawatt, and we are um, doing through a system multi-contracted to fully understand, um, because it's very, very important. But at the end of the day, if we want to make these kind of projects uh, feasible in terms of the economics of the project, we really need to scale, scale up and make, um, as Sarah was pointing out, um, more um, easy, the, like we're having right and bottom fix, right? So easy to, to, to create and to build monopiles. The ideal would be in the, in the future to have something similar for floating, and I think that's the, the only way, to be honest, to make it um, um, feasible economically. Thank you. Bridget, would you like to come in? Uh, so uh, the industrialization, I, I cannot help myself but uh, mention about the policy makers and uh, uh, in, in South Korea also the, there are strong pressures, political pressures to make a, to the, uh, for the developers to support the preemptive investment in the supply chain. And uh, so the developer wants to see the uh, significant progress of the projects, uh, the gov but the government uh, wants to see the uh, infrastructure investment, which it sounds like a chicken and egg uh, argument, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, we need to feed the chicken first so it can make more eggs, and the chicken is the project 
So, uh, for example, a couple of years ago, the, in South Korea, Korean government uh, announced to promote uh, floating offshore wind. But at that time, not many investors were interested in uh, investment in the infrastructures. But uh, as the floating projects are uh, progressed, there are, uh, we see nowadays many um, uh, the domestic and foreign companies are willing to uh, invest in the infrastructures and port and the supply chain. Uh, so that will be the key. Uh, and also the uh, full APEC market to be leading position in floating offshore wind. Uh, the, the, we need more collaboration uh, among APEC uh, countries. So for example, the countries around the North Sea uh, have built a strong collaboration on uh, port facilities and supply chains and workforces. So uh, I, I think the, uh, the, uh, that can be a good model uh, to uh, APEC countries. So, and uh, that is the, I think that is the only way to satisfy the APEC's huge demands in a more cost-effective manner than the cases where the, each country tries to do everything. And uh, lastly, also the inter-regional and uh, inter-industrial co collaboration will also be uh, helpful. Uh, the, for example, for those countries uh, without uh, strong track records on the offshore wind projects, they can partner up with the uh, uh, experienced European offshore wind developers and also considering the unique uh, the characteristics of, of floating offshore wind they can consider uh, of partnering up uh, with the oil and gas majors and the PPI. Uh, and also, the, uh, but at the same, at the mean, in the meantime, the, uh, still the local players are going to do a significant, significant role to secure the infrastructures and supply chain. So, uh, they, they, so lots of collaboration uh, will be necessary for the success of the floating offshore wind journey in APEC. Thank you. And Nick, you wanted to come in? Yep, I'll just be brief. Um, I think industrialisation of offshore wind in Australia is a challenge, be it fixed bottom or floating projects. So it's definitely not a challenge just for floating. Um, but I think the, uh, yeah, the opportunity is there to develop supply chains, to engage in the workforce uh, training and skills development. Um, at, at an early stage um, and bring floating along at the same pace as, as fixed within, within Australia. So there's definitely the capabilities there. With, you know, we don't know what local content requirements will be, uh, but I think you know, Australia is, is, is well positioned there. Um, we're currently doing industrialisation studies up in the Hunter for both steel and concrete. So looking at the opportunities there for floating bases, uh, both steel and concrete, I think there's absolutely the opportunity there. There, there are industries that are keen to be involved. Um, um, it's not there yet, but I think there is definitely the will to, uh, to make it happen. Okay, thank you. And now I know you're all really wanting to move on to ports, but our audience has got very lively, so I'm sorry. We're going to have to wait a little bit. Right, I've got a really, uh, I've got a really tricky question here now. Um, what level of rem remove... I cannot say that word. Please just say it all together. Thank you, real team effort. Do you see necessary for floating wind in order to make it viable? Who wants to take that first? Please, Jonathan, go ahead. What level of remuneration? So I think it's talking about subsidy levels. It is indeed. Um, very, very high subsidy levels. Um, <laughs> but it, it also depends on um, the wind, the capacity factor, the further out it is and the higher wind speeds will also help to cover the, the higher capital cost as well. So it, it's not a direct double the cost, double the subsidy. Um, it depends on where you are in the world and there's a, a range of other factors that fit into it. Um, but the subsidies, particularly for the first range of projects, like we've been talking about fixed bottom in Australia, will need very high subsidies to make sure that they, they go. And then over time, you'll see a cost out um, of the technology and the, the structures. And so initially, we expect it to be quite high. Thank you. Anyone else for? Okay, we can make this. Oh, go ahead. I'll just be really quick. You don't do offshore wind to do one project. You do offshore wind because it's a source of generation that you can build at scale over the course of 20, 30, 40 years and achieve really significant cost reductions. So don't expect 
in fixed or floating that you go right from zero to $50 per megawatt hour, right? You do a first project, you let the supply chain get experience with that first project, and then you can have cost out from there. And in the future, all the evidence suggests that floating offshore wind, fixed bottom offshore wind are going to be competitive over time. But you gotta have a long-term view. Thank you. Okay, what I'm gonna try and do is, um, I'm gonna attempt to be a little bit clever and um, try and uh, merge some questions into one and ask you all to comment on several issues in the interest of time. So I'd like each of you to touch on infrastructure requirements. Um, what are the differences between fixed and floating, particularly paying attention to port requirements? And what is the best approach to port upgrades? And also like you to comment on standardization. So I am going to come to you first, Nick. Sure. On, on the ports um, side of things, I think uh, I've, I mentioned before that you know, we have two natural uh, ports for the floating projects, uh, one for the Illawarra region, one for the Hunter region. So I guess the key uh, issue we're probably struggling with there is space at the ports. Um, so there's competing demands for the ports and the ports have got to make their own independent uh, business case for investing in the, in the ports to support offshore wind. Uh, as an example, up at Port of Newcastle, they have a, it, it, it's public a strategy to be a container port uh, terminal as, as well. So they're looking at available space. Do they develop that for containers, or do they do it to support offshore wind? I think there's a there's an argument there how they can sequence um, some of these activities, but it's a decision and a, um, a decision that needs to be made by the. Um, uh, but, but by, by the port on what activities they want to support. We can be highly influential and lobby for offshore wind, but it's a matter really of getting that space um, uh, at, at the port. And that's a challenge um, that we're finding for fixed bottom projects as well. Not we're talking about floating here, but you know, down in, down in Victoria, you know, it's the development supports is one of the key factors that I think is a potential hindrance to um, offshore wind in Australia, really meeting the, uh, the timelines we'd all like to see it achieve. Great, thank you. Jonathan? Uh, I don't think we've talked about the, the, the size. I think you mentioned a weight before, but each of, say you've got a 15 megawatt turbine, each of the floaters that we're looking at are about 4,000 tonnes and the size of a soccer pitch. I'll say soccer instead of football because this is Australia. Um, so it's huge. And when if you're building 500 megawatts or more, because you have to do at scale to get the, the economies of scale and the, and the cost down, um, then for 500 megawatts, you're talking 34 of these soccer pitches that you need to build on a port and store somewhere, uh, erect turbines at the port side, and then float out to wherever you're going to put them. So the, how do you manage that? And in a region like Hunter or where we are in Ulsan, where you've got multiple developers trying to access a single port area, it's a logistical nightmare. Um, so then, to Wujin's point, it comes back to policy offtake, making sure that you use that to also try and sequence and stagger and control, because as a developer com community, we're also in competition. So I can't see a world where we sit down together and we say, all right, I'll go first, you go second, because we all want to go first. Um, so there's all these logistical considerations that have to be worked through, and we don't have space. Um, so we need to make sure that the, the technology allows for a method that's modular and easily fabricated and allows for just in time or a proper sequencing and logistics to support that type of outcome as well. Thank you. Aaron? I think we've got a very good summary there. For me, when I talk about ports, it is just the critical aspect in industrialization. If you want to be able to deliver these platforms, if you want to be able to build supply chains behind those ports in order to actually do subcomponent fabrication, you need to be providing really world-class ports for floating offshore wind to host the construction in an efficient manner. And so, you know, after having good processes for getting site control to developers and having good offtake policies, investment in ports is and should be the number one priority for policymakers, especially if they have an ambition of um, hosting component fabrication in their markets. So you were going to speak more about ports, but... No, no, no. 
you guys yeah, are doing so, great. So go, go ahead. <laughs> no, um, I, I was also going to touch on what was said. Um, I mean, there are many things in ports in terms of the draft, for example, that is needed in some ports. And but I think if it's possible to have a reference Europe, um, in our case, for example, in Winfield Atlantic, we use two different ports. So if you can use more ports, um, and it's, it's possible also to use the whole region, uh, for example, Korea and Japan, that will open a lot of possibilities in terms of manufacturing, in terms of, um, and, and this is particularly important because when we hear some of these governments talking, they focus on having the lowest possible price. At the same time, they want to have a very localized market. So you have to create real expectations. I mean, if not, um, they will be frustrated and we cannot deliver what is expected, right? Um, I think there's a need for an open dialogue and understanding of what is needed for floating offshore wind. And of course, if it's possible to make some changes in terms of cabotage, for example, also, not only the ports, but also um, on the region and having all the different countries working together for the same purpose and more openness in terms of the uh, requirements for localization, that will also be very helpful. And Lujan, did you want to come in? I should. So the, uh, I, I agree with all the comments. Just just wanted to add to that, uh, you know, the for the project to be successful, I always said government doesn't need to do anything. Just let the private developers to do, which means, uh, so sometimes uh, the what is more important is uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, for example, the, uh, the SK Ocean Plant is planning to make a dedicated a yard for a floating uh, floaters, and that, that investment decision was made after they verified the uh, credible progress of the floating offshore wind in uh, in South Korea. So, just uh, I I would like to ask the government to uh, focus um, on the regulatory reformation to support the floating project. Uh, floating offshore wind project development, then the, there are many uh, the private investors and uh, uh, industrial players are ready to invest uh, preemptively. So there is. Thank you very much. Yeah. And our time is up. So Wujin, Peleo, Aaron, Nick, Jonathan, you've been wonderful. And thank you very much for joining us. Please join me in thanking our panelists.